Greetings, and welcome to Skylanders Portalcasters, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything Skylanders. I am your host, GF Ditto, and I am joined today by co-host Inklander and guest star Two We Me. And in today's episode, we are going to be discussing Toys for Bob versus Vicarious Visions. Who made the better games? So how are you both doing today, Two We Me? It is great to have you on the show. Ah, oh, it is great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm doing very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well also. Very excited for our season premiere here. Yes, this is the premiere of season two of Skylanders Portalcasters. I'm super excited to be able to bring this episode to you today. Uh, let's dive right into the meat of it then. So, Toys for Bob versus Vicarious Visions. Uh, let's let our guest star go first. And uh, two, let's hear some of your thoughts on this subject. Alright, well, anyone that watches my channel knows that I absolutely <laughs> hate the Vicarious Vision. I wouldn't say hate, but strongly dislike the Vicarious Visions games. Mainly Superchargers and Swap Force, as those are the games they made. But, um, yeah, so Superchargers, um, not a big fan of the combat with vehicles sections that just didn't do it for me. And Swap Force, I wasn't a fan of the story and the new graphics and stuff like that. And they took out heroic challenges, and I was a big fan of that. But, yep, that's where I stand on that. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I do kind of have to agree with a decent portion of that. Um, <laughs> Vicarious Visions definitely has um, issues, I think, when it comes to the gameplay side of things. And with post-game content, as we kind of talked about with Portal Master a couple episodes ago, um, where Swap Force almost had too much post-game content, and a lot of it just didn't feel like it was necessarily playtested very well. And then in Superchargers, it had, like, no post-game content. And then, um, really, Superchargers had the problem with the Force Vehicle section, so that really kind of brought down the game quite a bit. Uh, although I actually do think that Vicarious Visions probably, well, at least at least when it came to Superchargers, had a better story. Because I do think, while Toys for Bob does a really good job with gameplay, I really think that every once in a while it was pretty hit or miss with, with their storylines. I mean, let's be honest, though. Who actually plays Skylanders for the story? <laughs> I did. I, I do. Deep lore. <laughs> <laughs> Skylanders actually does have mad lore. It really does. It does, yeah. Have you read the Expanded Universe comic series? I haven't had the opportunity yet. I've read some of them. Ooh. Highly recommend. I'm definitely noting that down. <laughs> now, for me, I can partially agree with your statement. Uh, actually, mostly agree with your statement when it comes to Vicarious Visions. My big thing, Swap Force is at the bottom of the pile. Absolutely, 100%, unequivocally at the bottom of the pile. That's probably never going to change. Um, it All the challenges were too difficult for the sake of being too difficult. There's not a chance that a, a child could 100% that game. End of story. Um, and that, to me, takes a lot away from it. That shows, that between that and what seems to be a lack of playtesting in a lot of it, it really just doesn't seem to be that well made. That and the overabundance of what should have been post-game content, and a lot of it didn't feel like post-game content, because, once again, it required you to play through the entire game at least twice more. And then we jump over to Superchargers, where my biggest gripe with Superchargers is the fact that they went from Swap Force, which had this abundance of after-game content, to superchargers that had nothing. It just had a racing side mode, which I found to be really enjoyable, but it wasn't enough. And their their version of the heroic challenges just doesn't hold up. And also, once again, displayed a, a severe lack of playtesting that the Toys for Bob games don't have. Yeah, very true. Uh, something I thought of, too. So, um, I'm a big trophy hunter. Um, Same. I don't know if you... Yeah, so... Swap Force, I didn't even bother trying to get the platinum for it because I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, you have to get pretty much every single timed uh, level and 
I don't know, they, what is, I think it's bonus points or something levels. I forget the exact modes that they're called, but you had to do all of them for every single level and you had to score really well. And I was like, eh. So I, I have Platinum, Trap Team, Spires Adventure, Giants, um, and Imaginators. And some of them I'm working on my second Platinum of it on a different console. But yeah, so Wap Force and su Superchargers, maybe I might go for it, but I don't think I will. But yeah, I totally agree with. Uh, the post-game stuff that you were saying. Now, I've played all of these on Nintendo systems, so I don't have the uh, the PSN or Xbox achievements or trophies, but mm -hmm. I go for what I like to call the true 100%, where I do everything the game has to offer. I absolutely 100% complete everything, every Portal Master rank, every star in the game, everything that can possibly be done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've done that for Giants and Spire's Adventure, I think. And then maybe Trap Team on, like, the Wii U, I think. Well, you're more dedicated than I am because I've walked away from both Spyro's Adventure and Giants at this point in time. That's so sad because I really like Spyro's Adventure and Giants. I know! Well, if only they were actually good games. They are! <laughs> wow! Like, the the balancing in these games is ridiculous. Well, yeah, the balancing had issues until Trap Team. But still, I mean, I really like the gameplay of it. Like, I think the whole dungeon crawler aspect of the first two games is really just a lot of fun. It does play fun until they shut off the lights on you and your vision-impaired self can't, uh, can't do it. Just use a fire skylander to do that. Just get a ruptor and you're good. I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Why did nobody tell me this? How did you know that? I never knew that. Really? Oh, uh, yeah, I like any Fire Skylander. I uh, I know Eruptor first shared like, his like lob attack, his first attack. It'll like light up that area. Also, unless it's Superchargers, I avoid Eruptor like the plague because he's straight trash. He is. Oh my gosh. They, they It took them a while to figure out lob attacks for characters is not good in a mostly dungeon crawler type setup. <laughs> it, it really did, and Shroom Boom is also proof of this. Ah, uh, yeah. On the Toys for Bob side of things, since I've already gotten started on that, their balancing was absolute garbage until Trap Team. Then they finally started to figure that out. The damage you take is not proportionate at all with the damage that you deal. And some characters are clearly far more OP than others. Like, there are definitely character tiers. And there, there doesn't seem to be any real balance between the elements themselves, the damage that you're dealing versus receiving, or how, how good characters are compared to each other. And overall, it just becomes this jumbled, unbalanced mess. Yeah, it very much felt like in the first two games, they were more so concerned with like, oh, we need a lobber in this category, or we need a dragon in this category. Um, they were more concerned with fighting types as opposed to the actual damage that they were dealing and the actual stats that the characters had. Which is something they went back and screwed up again in Imaginators with the villains. <laughs> oh, yeah. So when it comes to balancing... Uh, Toys for Bob was the one to finally get it right, but it took them an entire two games before they did, and then they threw it off with their fourth game. Yeah, I would say Toys for Bob was also the first uh, one to get the jumping right, because I know they were very against it in the first two games. They really didn't want it to happen because they figured it'd be just a little too complex for, for uh, some of the younger audience to be able to do. Um, but when it got introduced in Swap Force, oh boy, it's very stiff. Like, it it's, really is. it's yeah. really not great. And then Trap Team finally, like, really, like, loosened it up a bit and made it a little bit easier to get jumps. And also, for all the characters, they added in a jump attack as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can actually now attack while you're in the air while jumping for all the characters, which was something Swap Force did not introduce. Well, and in uh, Trap Team as well, they have some Skylanders that can fly using the jump attack, like Nightlight and Chopper, which I thought was a neat little touch. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think that was a very cool way to kind of bring back the flying mechanic without making it intrusive by making it a third attack. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I can't tell you, when it comes to the jumping, I can't tell you the number of times I have been in the middle of a Swap Force speed run, And this is particularly an issue in Motleyville, where oh, yeah. you've got the whirlpools with the spinning tires. I cannot tell you how many times 
as a speedrunner who has practiced this hundreds of times at this point, I can't tell you how many times I go to make that jump onto one of those tires and I just flat out miss because the jumping is that tight. Yeah. I, I think the level layout too makes it kind of hard to judge sometimes. It really depends on the level, but yeah, that's what I found. It's very tight and then it's hard to judge like how much you need to like go forward or angle it to get on whatever platform or what you need to jump on. Yes. Yeah. When you've been speed running as much as I have, this is something I have practiced hundreds and hundreds of times. And when it's that inconsistent because of how tight the mechanic is, that's a scenario where practice can never make perfect. Yeah, like I can understand that. Um, and, you know, but one one good thing that I can say about superchargers is at least it seems to me that they took the, like, jumping values. Whatever, whatever Toys for Bob did to the jumping, it seems that Vicarious Visions took with them when they were making superchargers. Uh, because superchargers, the jumping in that actually feels a little bit more fluid as well. Much more fluid than it did in Swap Force. I don't know, on the balancing thing, though, I would say that didn't really bother me that much. I, I see exactly what you're saying, but I don't know. I It gave more variety in the characters, I felt like, because some of them, yeah, they were really easy. But if you had a character that was a lot harder to master, it made going through a level like more fresh and I really appreciated that. It's like, oh yeah, I can beat this level easy with like Bash or something, but you know, I want to try like a harder character who's a lot harder to master. Um, I don't know. That's why I really love the original two games was it wasn't that the levels were like super varied or whatever. It was like you had variety in the characters and how you played them. And I, uh, back in the day when I was buying Skylanders all the time, I still am, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I would play with people, uh, coming over my house all the time and family members, like my dad and I would always do co-op and we would have so much fun just like switching out the characters and finding the best combos and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I can understand that side of it. Um, but I think the main problem with the balancing and imaginators was more so with the villains in particular, them giving them trying to fit them to a particular battle class. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I'm talking more about giants and uh, Spire's adventure. But yeah, they ro they royally screwed up the villains and imaginators, particularly. Uh, I don't know, my biggest pet peeve was Hoodsicle, because he was one of my favorite villains in Trap Team, and they he's just so nerfed, like, it, it made me so frustrated. They did nerf him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they nerfed yeah. just about every villain, except Chaos, who was oh, yeah. pretty much a lateral shift. Yeah, yeah. So, I know, and then and then they also did the really weird... Just like giving Chompy Mage a bazooka and Blastertron, who has Blaster in his name, a knight. <laughs> and well, just... well, Chompy Mage too. A mage is like a sorcerer kind of thing. Why would you put him in bazooka? He has a staff <laughs> on his figure. <laughs> I know. Oh my... Just it's just weird. It's like they didn't know what they were doing. That was a time when they tried to balance it too hard, and it did not work. <laughs> Well, Grave Clobber too wasn't he? I think Earth in the original game, but then they changed him to Water, which I guess kind of works. But eh. Grave Clobber <laughs> has been three elements. Yeah, because actually his element got changed to Earth last minute during production. Now I would also it's like to point ridiculous. out that at least the first three, the first three of the three DS games were also produced by Vicarious Visions. I was gonna bring up. The 3DS games, because I have a completely different take on them. They were, once again, the same gripe I had with Swap Force. They were hard for the sake of being hard. Those three level stars in every boss battle, at least in the first two games, there's that don't get hit star. I've got to wonder, whose idea was that? And what? how do you expect a child to be able to do this? <laughs> I, I really enjoy the more platformery aspects of the 3DS games. Because, oh, yes, absolutely. Like, you know, in mm -hmm. the original Spyro's Adventure on console, there was no jumping. But then when you go to 3DS, you've got double jumping. <laughs> and it's just, it's like such a drastic shift. Like, they feel like different games. They have different storylines. And while the concept is, like, similar with the bringing the toys to life, um, 
it's i don't know i actually kind of really like a lot of the 3ds games i do agree with you that i think in many cases they are a little bit more challenging than need be like it can be really hard to uh get some of the level stars and it feels like you do kind of have to go back and play through a level a couple times in order to be able to get some of them but Mm -hmm. um overall like the actual like setup of the gameplay of the 3ds games in most cases is actually not bad it was actually really good yeah i Mm -hmm. wouldn't call it like a dungeon crawler but what they did present was pretty interesting what they presented was a platforming adventure with dungeon crawling aspects and villains that were actually really really cool i really enjoyed pretty much every villain that came out of the 3ds games yeah, and I mean, uh, with Superchargers, they brought back some of the main villains of the 3DS games. Like, they had Frightbeard and Moneybone in some way, shape, or form Superchargers, which was cool. That they did. I was just sorry to see that Hector and the Dream Sheep didn't make it. Yeah, for the 3DS uh, games, though, my like list uh, or ranking of the games is quite different. So, I would actually say uh, Swap Force was my favorite of the 3DS games mainly because of how they did the Skylanders like stored in the game and how easy it was to change them. They royally screwed this up for the Switch. They completely botched it, but they did this perfectly where you just tap the Skylander you want, they had them completely sorted, and someone who has tons and tons of Skylanders, it made it so easy to just boom, boom, and pick it uh, which Skylander I want. I also, uh, who was the villain in Swap Force? I remember really enjoying that. Money Money Bone. I thought it was Money Bone, okay. But yeah, I I really enjoyed him. He was fun. The other thing, too, is um, a problem that I had with the console version of Swap Force was how difficult it was to level Skylanders up, even on the hardest difficulty. Like, they they just didn't level up, but then when I would go to the 3DS version, I could level up all my Skylanders, save them, and then go to it the console versions and spire's adventure yeah like i didn't really like the whole you only get two skylanders um and some of the gameplay i think they really improved upon in the other games trap team was very for the 3ds was very similar to swap force except i thought it was more glitchy and had more bugs absolutely it did yeah i i ran into a game breaking bug where i had to delete my whole file skylanders and all Oh my. (laughs) Because I literally could not switch my Skylander. It would stay on the elemental screen forever. Oh no. (laughs) I literally let it try to load for 15 minutes and Mm. then had to shut down the whole system. I never played Giants or the Superchargers one, so I can't really speak for that. But definitely Swap Force was my favorite out of the 3DS ones. Um... But yeah, this it was the least buggy. It had, I think, the most interesting story, and the gameplay was a lot of fun. And I loved the storing mechanic of Skylanders, cause it took way too long for Skylanders to be scanned in, which really annoyed me. So I liked the fact that I could store them in, and then only when I was done with them and wanted to save their progress, then I would put, you know, them on the portal. But I don't know what you guys think about that. <laughs> I happen to really enjoy all of the 3DS games except Trap Team, and that's because of how buggy and glitchy it was. Mm. Yeah, I can get that. Like, my my favorites when it comes to the platformery kind of thing is probably Swap Force and Spyro's Adventure. The Superchargers racing game is actually pretty solid. Like, I think it's a pretty great racing game on the 3DS. Yes, and I was about to say that actually Superchargers is the best of the 3DS games, in my opinion. It was the best game overall. It had the sorting of the Skylanders that was really good from Swap Force without the bugginess of Trap Team. And as a kart racing game, it was actually very solid. Yeah, like I would say that it rivals Mario Kart 7 on the 3DS. Really? Oh, I'll have to check it out then. It it was everything Diddy Kong Racing tried to be and more. Is it multiplayer? Um, Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, How about Giants, though? Uh... No. Yeah, Gi- Giants was like, okay. I liked it slightly less than Spyro's Adventure. It was pretty much the same, only I liked Hector more than Frightbeard. Honestly, I felt like Hector was more of a threat than Chaos, even. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hector, yeah Hector's like, I know. terrifying. 
because it also has that like hurry up stuff yes <laughs> oh <laughs> yes oh that's so oh. like i don't know if you guys have played the sonic games but like throw back to sonic when you're drowning and it's like you know oh god that sounds stressful it just look up Sonic Drowning theme and you'll totally get what I'm talking about. It's the most terrifying, stressful music ever. <laughs> so I overall enjoyed Spyro's Adventure more than Giants, but Giants was almost as good on the 3DS. Now, when oh, it yeah. comes to the console versions, I pile them at the bottom right above Swap Force. Wow. I, wow. I, I, I love the like dungeon crawler aspects of the first two. I mean... Um, I, I think two will disagree with me on this, but personally, I think one of the biggest things that really just brings down the first two games is the fact that it's on an outdated graphics engine. At the graphics, I kind of like better. I know that's a controversial opinion, but uh, Swap Force and I'm trying to remember if the other two, the Trap Team kind of toned it down a bit, but yeah, they look really plasticky and i don't know how to describe it but oh yeah especially the choppies yeah i I just really didn't like that and i really appreciated how everything blended together well and something else i just thought of was uh i think that uh spires avenger had the best hub world out of all of them like i just love the hub world i love the exploration in the hub world like how vast it is see i disagree with that i preferred the map yeah, I feel like if they wanted to um, do another, like, map kind of situation in the future, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Like, honestly, I think them having the MAP was just one step closer to making Skylanders an open world game, which I'm not opposed to. So, <laughs> you know, I, I liked it. Something I've always wanted in Skylanders is to put as many Skylanders as you want and have, like, a giant army and have, like, a total, like brawl with like thousands of like i don't know this is just my weird like dream about skylanders i'm like oh, i just want to be able to scan as many as possible and then just have them duke it out just just have a skylanders warriors game <laughs> oh my god skylanders <laughs> warriors crossover that would be that would be better than dessert for me that'd be so much fun like i, I literally just thought of that on the spot <laughs> Uh, as, as like Tui Me was saying that, I was like, that sounds kind of like it'd just be a Warriors game. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it is. It yeah. is, but just Skyland. <laughs> or, or like a Warriors game combined with like the Wonderful 101 or something, where you just have like a bunch of like Skylanders swarming against a bunch of enemies. <laughs> and they form like a giant sword or something. <laughs> like, there you go. <laughs> like, there we go. That's the game. It, it just needs to be Skylanders Warriors 101. Boom. It's there done. you go. <laughs> Let's contact Team Ninja. Get them on it immediately. Oh, yeah. They're missing so, out. <laughs> yeah. Some some sort of something like bringing the MAP back would be a good thing. Like, I think that was a good change from, from Toys for Bob because I think that that also has a good amount of exploration because it has the extra, like, side levels that pop up occasionally that you can go do. Um, it has the replayable Sky Stones and the Battle Arena, which, granted, those are integrated as part of the story and both have basically just been ported from the previous games anyway but it's still nice to have that there's like secret hidden caves there's the whole rat kingdom and then also all the levels and elemental realms are just kind of randomly spread out throughout the map and i kind of really like that it'd be fun to see them do something very similar with that but just have the levels all like integrated into the like map <laughs> Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I personally, like, just didn't like the Imaginators <laughs> hub world. I don't know. I just don't like how tiny they are and oh, how yeah. I, I wish, I don't know, does Imaginators have a chapter select? Because I don't think it does. No. That annoyed me so much. Like, that yeah. is my biggest gripe with Imaginators. That's probably, outside of music, my only real complaint about Imaginators is the lack of a chapter select screen. It, it needed fast travel points. I yes. think. Yeah. Yeah, if not a chapter select. But yeah, I think I like Trap Team, like, a lot more than, like, the Hub World, uh, more than Imaginators. I mean, I like Trap Teams, too. Um, like, I, I like how the Academy in Imaginators is kind of like a combination of, like, the Superchargers version of the Academy and the Trap Team one. I think they found, like, a good melding there of, like, making it feel... Um, just kind of a little bit more run down and kind of combining some of the aspects from Superchargers into it. 
like I and I don't know I kind of liked how the academy was integrated as part of an even larger map but I do agree with the fact that the Skylanders being really tiny uh is weird and they also sped up all the Skylanders yep. on yes. the map yep. which is especially weird because if your character has a charge attack they didn't speed up the charge attacks I so know. your charge attacks go slower <laughs> yep. yes it's very <sighs> weird and I don't like that it is very very weird so I would like them to bring it back, but they would need to fix that, because that, that was just an awkward thing. <laughs> if, like, you're playing a Spyro and he just starts going really slowly. I, I would say the best way to judge, like, in my opinion, to judge how good a hub world is, is how easy it is to find, like, what you need to find. And I think uh, Imaginators did a good job when you are initially trying to get to the levels with the little dots. Like, I really appreciate that. But once you beat the game, it's like... Where the heck is Scholarville again? Like, I have no idea, and I have to look it up, and they should have had, like, a chapter select or something like that, and that was really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Like, I, I feel like if they had, like, an actual map for the map, <laughs> that would yes! be nice. Like, something you can oh, pull yeah. up, like, in Breath of the Wild, where you can pull it up and then just hit, or, or in Skyrim, and, like, just scroll around and zoom in and then be, like, fast travel. <laughs> That would yes, have been really please. Cool. Yeah, that would have been much needed. And with the cannons too, where you have to go to different islands to get to different levels. Uh, also. And the animation's so slow for it. Yep. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's problems. <laughs> I like the idea overall, but like they would need to tweak it a little bit more if they brought it back for another game. On the overall topic of who made the better games, I would say that the 3DS games would put Vicarious Visions back in the running because obviously their console games were not the best. I would still say that, for one, there's barely any complaints at all about Trap Team, other than the fact that there's too much stuff uh, to go out and buy. So between that and the gameplay from Imaginators, I would say that Toys for Bob does make the better game. I would agree. I would agree as well. Like, I think the main things that Vicarious Visions has going for them is, like, they occasionally, I think, get story beats and character development a little bit better. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think their graphics engine's better, personally. Uh, I mean, I do agree that I think a lot of the characters look a little bit plasticky uh, in Swap Force, but I think they toned it back very much so in the next couple games, except for Imaginators. Imaginators, they just looked really weird. I don't know why. <laughs> But I, like, what yeah. did they do to Spyro and Imaginators? Yeah, it's just like everything in Imaginators just looks like it's made out of clay or something. Yeah. And I don't like it. <laughs> but Trap Team and Superchargers, that got it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would agree. Sorry, yeah, Trap Team, I would say, would be the, in my opinion, the best, like, not looking, but like most natural of the Skylanders games, like, without being too plasticky, but also having a better graphics engine. I believe Toys for Bob just kind of wins this. Yeah, I, I think Toys for Bob kind of just also hands down wins this, because I think, uh, o like, overall, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, uh, it's really gameplay that wins out over everything, you know? And, and I also think they had better character design, honestly. That's something we didn't even touch on at all, but, like, when oh, it comes yeah. to the lineups of all the games, I tend to way more prefer... The Toys for Bob games over the Vicarious Visions games. That's oh yeah, fair. the Trap Masters are fantastic. Yeah. The entire Trap Team lineup was fantastic. Oh yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, when you hit Vicarious Visions games, most of their characters kind of feel mediocre, but then like they do typically have like a couple in the lineup that like they are good. <laughs> like they're just flat out really good characters and they quickly become fan favorites. But other like Roller Brawl or Stormblade or Splat. But like overall though, you know, like Vicarious Visions like will occasionally have that like one shining character that's like, yes, this is an amazing character. But the rest of them just kind of feel like, yeah, they're okay. <laughs> but Toys for Bob, I think, almost consistently tends to have pretty solid character design and gameplay mechanics. Yes, absolutely. On the topic of character design, I happen to really enjoy finding a really well-designed character for a really low price. Let's shoot on over to our legendary treasure hunt, where we can shop for a bargain. Hello, 
uh, welcome to the legendary treasure segment. I have picked the challenge. I am a huge fan of Drobot and Drobit. So the challenge is you have to find a lot that has as many Drobot slash Drobits in it that's under $30. And you get one point for every Drobot or Drobit. You get half a point for every five dollars you are under the max price and you get minus half a point for shroom boom and i get to give out one extra point ditto would you like to introduce your lot first sure i can do that all right so this week i found my lot on mercari this lot contains seven skylanders including Series 2 Drobot, Series 1 Drobot, and Drobit. My lot also includes a melted version of the Fiery Forge, Sprocket, Chopper, and Trigger Snappy. Although, I don't know, maybe a dog chewed on it. Also looks like a dog could have gotten a hold of that. Like... Nah, nah. I, I like the melted version. That's like a new <laughs> variant of it. <laughs> yes, there you go. That lot's actually worth 300 <laughs> and, and this entire lot is listed at a price of $22. Very nice. Ditto has three Drobots, Lightcore Drobot, Series 1 Drobot, and Drobit, so that gives three points. And Ditto is also half a point under the max price, so therefore Ditto gets a final score of three and a half points. And there were no shroom booms, so no losses of points. Awesome, I'll take that. Unlike my lot. <laughs> All right, you want to introduce your lot? Sure. So, uh, because the world is ending, I found my lot not on eBay this week, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I found it on OfferUp. Um, I'm finally taking Ditto's advice after all these episodes to start scouring <laughs> other sites <laughs> uh, because this was a hard challenge. It really was. I'm, I'm very it was proud a of hard my challenge. Flanders. Yeah, I know. So I found a revenge lot. <laughs> Uh, it is 80 Skylanders for $2. <laughs> um, and in my lot, I have a decent variety of Skylanders across all the games, but specifically for this challenge, I have a Lightcore Drobot and a Series 1 Drobot. Uh, however, my lot also happens to have two Shroom Booms. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> That's a big oof. So taking a look at Inklander's lot, we have two Drobots, Lightcore Drobot and Series 1 Drobot, and Ink is $28 under the price limit, which means Ink gets two and a half points for that, but Ink had two Shroom Booms, which means minus one point, a half for each of them. That brings the total to three and a half points, and I will also... <laughs> Give the extra bonus point for having the most Skylanders in a lot. Awesome. So that brings the total to four and a half points. So Inklander was tied with me until that bonus point. Hooray. I know exactly how it feels to get those revenge lots and then find out they're worth no points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. It's it's that it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, as amazing as the lot is if it doesn't quite fit the challenge and if it has a lot of shroom booms in it it just makes your point score go all over the place it really <laughs> does but i will say i am super proud of you not only for branching out and finding something other than ebay but for actually finding a revenge lot because those are very challenging to find all right so my lot comes from mercari it's not very interesting but we have uh, two Drobots, uh, Lightcore and Series 1, and that's all that's in the lot, and it is $12. This is a pretty good lot, um, because, you know, if you're looking specifically for Drobots, then this is something you'd want to pick up. And 12 bucks for two Drobots, that's actually a really, really good deal. Drobot tends to retail on eBay on its own for $24.99. So to find two of it for half that is a significant deal. So yeah, I had two Drobots. I was 18 under the limit, so that means I get a point and a half uh, extra for that, which puts me to a point total of three and a half. So if it wasn't for that bonus point, we all would have tied this week. <laughs> we all we, would have tied yep. this week. <laughs> wow. All right, well, the winner is Inklander. Congratulations. Awesome. Winner by one point. The revenge lot takes it this time. Congrats, Inklander. <laughs> 
Thank you, yeah. Hey guys, I can see that Glumshakes has almost got his college degree. Let's head on the Dread Yacht to go celebrate. So here we are aboard the Dread Yacht, but things are not as peaceful as they usually are for our destination. We're, we're taking fire. These are heavy cannons pointed at us right now. I have no idea what's going on. I thought we were just stopping through for a quick visit to Scholarville, and we're under siege here. This week, we are visiting Scholarville from Skylanders Imaginators. Basically, Scholarville is uh, pretty trash level, mainly because of the stinking, what is it called? This evil sea monster. It is the worst boss fight, if you want to even call it that, in all of Imaginators, in my opinion. So this stupid thing has so much health and it never wants to die. And even if you have like spectacular Skylanders, nothing will put a dent in its health. And you have to keep fighting it three or four times and you have to wait and wait and wait while the stupid waves come by it's just utter utter horrendous level design i don't know why they did it yeah i i agree with that <laughs> wholeheartedly as much as i like the doomlanders i happen to like the sewer monster more yeah it's scripted so his health doesn't go down as quickly because it is a scripted battle you do have to do three or four sets of attacks against him it holds to the standard uh pattern of a skylanders boss fight where you have to dodge some sort of hazard and then beat on the boss a little bit uh, pretty much every boss fight in these games has been scripted to be broken down to three or four waves even in this game you know, you, you whittle down the Doomlander's HP a little bit, and then Chaos gives him a boost. And then you whittle it down again another third, and then it gets another boost. And then you can finally win that. It's the same thing with the Sewer Monster, only the Sewer Monster felt a little more natural than some of the Doomlanders have. Well, uh, what I say to that is... Typical Skylanders boss fights allow you to dodge and attack, where this boss fight was you were either attacking or you were either, you know, dodging, and that made it feel like much more of a drag than any other boss fight. Yeah, especially because there's those segments where you're trying to get up to the next arena to deal damage to the sea monster, and like if you and like you can deal some damage to it, but it's not a lot. And then if you manage yeah. to get hit by it, it knocks you into the like sewage, and then you have to restart that whole section again. Yep. <laughs> it's just so tedious. Like there's no reason why they had to do that, and yet they did. And I feel like they were trying to make it seem like it's a bigger and more exciting section of the level than it actually is. And then another thing that I don't like about the sea monster is it's very clearly just like a reused uh, granted it's a little bit different but like they basically took like the sea monster from sewers of supreme stink and just modified it a little bit and they're like yep here's our new sea monster it feels so out of place too in the level like it's so out of place that's another thing i don't like about this level is it feels like they just took ideas from like this is a problem man changers has in general but like it feels like they took ideas from previous skylanders levels from previous skylanders games including previous like assets and they were just like yeah so the first part of this we're gonna have it be like library sections and then we're gonna have it be like a bunch of ships that you're jumping around and then we're gonna have it be a sewer and it and, and it's like the beginning part of the level kind of felt like it's supposed to be like a scholarville area but then the rest of it is just like all over the place i will agree that the inclusion of the sewers did feel a little bit random but i happen to enjoy the boss fight itself more than most of the doomlanders I will say for the Doomlander uh, boss fight at the end, I like the design, and something I did like about it was how the Doomlander can damage itself and the cannons can damage it. Like, that's something missing in a lot of them, is if there's, like, other enemies attacking, you know, they don't really damage it typically in a game, but I thought it was really cool. All his cannon fire can hurt him. All the extra cannons that Chaos is shooting hurt him. The boss fight itself, though, is pretty stale as you can just stand in front of the Doomlander and hit him and just yeah. gotta move a little bit to the right or left. Yeah, it's a Doomlander fight. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's the same thing. 
I happened to pull the most enjoyment out of the Doomlander fight itself in Nightmare Difficulty, because it wasn't just hit him until he goes down. In that case, it was a lot more strategic. Yeah, I can understand that. And that's typically usually where you get a little bit more strategy with your moveset, is if you bump it up to, like, hard. Trap team, my goodness. I think I used nearly all of my collection on Chaos, my goodness. But yeah, so I can understand cranking up the difficulty on the Doomlander would make it a little bit more exciting. But otherwise, like, I do agree that it feels slightly different from a typical Doomlander fight, but it still just feels like a Doomlander fight. Like, they typically, even though they have different weapons, it doesn't really feel like there's usually that much variation to them. Facts. And they also still have the whole, like, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, which is typical for video games especially like you know zelda games are very traditionally having like the phase one phase two kind of thing mm-hmm. but at least with zelda games it feels like there's actually a distinct difference with play style between the phases meanwhile with the doom landers it's just like it more enemies start attacking you or something or like the doom lander deals a little bit more damage and it's just meh <laughs> But that's also typical of Skylanders games in general. I mean, if we look back at Swap Force at the Mesmeralda boss battle, um, it's the same way. You just have a couple more obstacles to dodge in between chances to hit her. Yeah, but I feel like the obstacles are a little bit more varied. Like, you get the spinning enemies, you get the bombs, you get all the, like, lasers and things like that. Like, I I really kind of prefer that because those are also very unique specifically to that fight. Meanwhile, with the Doomlander, it always is just, like, enemies are coming in or, like, the Doomlander. Like, it it just always feels almost very identical in the way that that fight happens. But meanwhile, with Mesmeralda, a lot of that is, like, very specifically stuff that happens only in the Mesmeralda fight. That's, That's fair. But, yeah, the rest of this level just kind of feels like, I don't know, like a rehash of previous levels. Um, I honestly, like, for, like, Scholarville, I would have really preferred them doing something maybe a little bit more similar to, like, Spellpunk Library. Oh, true. Something where it's, like, you're trying to traverse through a library and you're having to, like, push back, like, secret bookcases or something like that. And then you find treasure chests or soul gems or things like that that way. Like, I feel like they could have done something really unique with it. And instead, we just kind of get this weird combination of, like, I don't know, like, Iron Jaw Gulch with, like, Time Town with, like, Secret Sewers of Supreme Stink. And while all those levels, I think, well, except Iron Jaw Gulch, that's rather mediocre. But, like, the other levels feel distinct in themselves, but here this level doesn't really ever get a particular level of cohesion that I like. I agree with that, yeah. I think it would be interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever played Mario Party, but Mario Party on the DS had this uh, level where you were but you like you were saying like in a library and there were books and they had all these unique like shortcuts and stuff like that and if they had done something at all with scholarly like that it would have been way more interesting than this weird hodgepodge of multiple levels because like when you think of scholarville you're not thinking of fighting a sewer I don't know what it was, sewer monster. Yeah, like, you aren't expecting to find, like, the Helm of Wisdom in the sewer. Like, that doesn't make yeah. sense. It's like, that's an interesting hiding place for that, I guess. <laughs> Especially because, like, I feel like if a bad guy in any kind of piece of media is going to infiltrate somewhere, they tend to go through the sewer anyway. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. you're just giving it to them at that point. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, (laughs) it's just like (laughs) literally just giving them the helm. So it's just, I I, yeah, I don't know. Um, This level is just kind of all over the place. I don't think it's necessarily the worst Imaginator level. I think that, that, to me, goes to Fizzland, but um, (laughs) I think that level's all kinds of awful. But this level, for what it's... For what it is, I think it's, like, fine. Like, it's just basically another one of those, like, hodgepodge kind of levels in Imaginators where it just pulls things from the previous games and makes a level out of it. So it's not awful, but it's definitely not anything that's overly memorable. Well, and now that I've taken offense to these two hating all over my favorite level in the game, I think we need to move on over to the Archean Arena and uh, hash this out like Portal Masters. Here we are 
once again in the Archean Arena, where we pit Skylander against Skylander in hypothetical combat, because Toys for Bob felt like they could take out PvP and get away with it in Trap Team. So, let's go ahead and start off with our guest star, Two Wee Me, and find out which Skylander you've brought to the arena today. Okay, so my Skylander is Legendary Series 2 Slam Bam, because my sister's favorite Skylander is Slam Bam. And why not give him a little edge? Alright, his battle class is melee. His first attack is the Yeti Fist. His second attack is Ice Prison. And his third attack is the Yeti Ice Shoe Slad. Legendary Slam Bam has a health of 930, a critical hit of 66, armor of 43, speed of 32, and luck of 32. Meanwhile, his attack 1 deals 55 damage. Uh, his attack 2 deals 51 damage, and his attack 3 deals 0 damage. So, Tui <laughs> Me, do you want to go ahead and describe the different uh, path options for Legendary Slam Bam? Alright, so Slam Bam's first path is the Blizzard Brawler path, which his attack 1 gains some combos and increased damage, and he gets some nice shiny armor. The second path is Glacier Hit which attack two gains some more range, he gets some duration, and he deals some more damage. Well, yeah, it's really cool to see Legendary Slam Bam, or just Slam Bam generally, uh, take the stage here in the Archean Arena. I think Slam Bam's a pretty fun character. I don't necessarily think he's maybe the most powerful of that, out of all characters, but honestly, for a like fun melee character, uh, I really, really like his design, and I really like his moveset, and he was one of my favorites back uh, when I first started playing the game in Giants. I just think he's a lot of fun. Uh, I like his personality. I just really kind of overall like everything about him. He's definitely just a really cool character to play as. He's fun to play as, which is nice. So going off of all that, Ditto, who did you decide to bring to the Archean Arena this week? All right, time to settle it. Like a portal master, I'm going to be super ultra petty, and I'm going to bring Nitro Magna Charge. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh my god. I'm actually kidding. I'm actually kidding. I considered it briefly, but instead I'm going to be joined by Lightcore Countdown. Oh, all right. Ooh. Okay. So go ahead and describe uh, Lightcore Countdown a little bit for us. Lightcore Countdown is a ranged tech element Skylander who honestly is a bit of a blast to play as. His attack one is Rocket Blast, which fires rockets ahead of him. One at a time can rapid fire it, though. Uh, his attack two is called Bomb Head, and it, it shoots his head forward, which explodes and damages enemies in a large area. It's gotta hurt. And his attack three summons bomb allies that explode near enemies. So... Light, a little bit more about the stats of Light Core Countdown. He has a health of 870, a critical hit of 62, armor of 27, speed of 38, and luck of 22. His attack 1 deals 26 damage. His attack 2 deals 23 damage with a 48 damage finisher. And his attack 3 deals 32 damage. So Ditto, do you want to go ahead and detail the upgrade paths for us? So his top path is called Bomb Buddies Forever, and what that does is it allows four bomb allies to be active at once, increases their damage, and allows for the bomb allies to shoot flames from their fuses that cause additional damage to nearby enemies. His bottom path is the Rocketeer path, which allows attack one to gain charge, and when released, fires two smaller rockets alongside the charged one. Rocket attacks all do even more damage, and the charged rockets do increase damage in a larger area. So they, they gain an explosion. All right, so it seems like we have two pretty formidable characters for the Archean Arena this week. But wait, there's a flash of light. Oh my god, you say Nitro Magnet Charge. <laughs> <laughs> and another portal opens, and it turns out that Grave Clobber is going to be entering oh. the arena. <laughs> All right, so a little information about Grave Clobber. He's a water element melee character with a health of 1,200, a critical hit of 105, armor of 32, speed of 52, and luck of 31. 
His attack 1 is Clobber Punch, which deals 103 damage, but 106 damage when charged. Attack 2 is Gator Geyser, which summons up one of the totems, which deals 123 damage. And then his attack 3 is Big Splash, where he basically uh, jumps and does a belly flop and slams down into the ground, and that deals 92 damage with 45 residual damage. His top path is Heavyweight Champion, where attack 1 has increased damage and combos, and attack 1 on attack 2 explodes. Meanwhile, his bottom path is Wave Maker, where attack 2, when charged, draws in foes, has increased damage, and you can combo attack 3 for improved damage. So now that we have three champions in the arena, it's really time for the Archean Arena fight to get started. All right, I'm going to say it first. I'm staying the heck away from the both of you. <laughs> because I at least have the advantage of range. Two, we are completely outclassed by the Imaginator. Obviously, Imaginator's stats are just so much higher. Or Sensei's stats are just so much higher. Yeah. The first thing I would do would be to try and put some distance between myself and Graveclobber, throw up some bomb allies and uh, fire rockets in Grave Clobber's direction, try and provide cover fire for two, hoping that, for Slam Bam, hoping that Slam Bam will be able to uh, help whittle down that Grave Clobber quicker. Um, because that my my objective here would be to try to, uh, try to basically team up against the Grave Clobber, knowing that my chances against Slam Bam are, uh, honestly, Slam Bam doesn't stand a chance against Countdown. Yeah. And, and Slam Bam doesn't stand a chance against Grave Clobber either. Wow. No, but if my my thought process here is if uh, we can whittle down the Grave Clobber enough, uh, there, there is a good chance that Grave Clobber won't win. It's possible. I will say that Slam Bam's third attack is uh, quite underlooked, but I think the speed could give him an edge against Countdown if he can get close enough and if he uses the ice he could um freeze him for a bit so he could get close enough because it does have quite a bit of range so i wouldn't just count him out just yet like i mean like i mean i feel like slam bam can probably defend himself okay but i think for the most part he's almost always going to be finishing him last i mean grave clobber is basically just a more powerful slam bam honestly <laughs> Uh, like, Grave Clobber has, uh, the speed up, Grave Clobber definitely has the critical hit way up, and then all of Grave Clobber's attacks do a ton of damage, so really the first thing I'd be doing is I'd probably just go up to Slam Bam, hit him a couple times, and destroy him. Slam Bam might be able to get a couple, like, hits on me by freezing me, or by managing to, like, skate around me a little bit, be able to, like, snowboard around me. But for the most part, I think I'm probably going to just go ahead and attack Slam Bam pretty easily and just go ahead and take Slam Bam out. And while that's happening, I, I would be sending bomb buddies in your direction and cramming as many rockets into your backside as possible, hoping <laughs> hoping to diminish that massive 1200 HP. Yeah, so that's the thing is like your, your attacks there, uh, your attack three, if you're able to send out a couple at a time, which, you know, definitely if I'm trying to deal with Slam Bam, you'd be able to do, you'd probably be able to get me down to probably, I'd say, close to half health. But, like, by the time that I end up killing Slam Bam... Countdown would have to keep its his distance at all times. Yeah. yeah. Like, run and summon thing. enemies. I mean, run and summon bombs, run and summon bombs, and that would probably be the path I would try to take, because... In that case, unlike every other instance we've had so far where the objective is to just stay as far away as possible, with the inclusion of having minions to fight for me and to just, you know, go run behind me and deal damage and deal damage that way, um, I, I do feel like in this case, running away could be a viable option. That's true, although I can also put down totems and that's going to mess with you as well. <laughs> that's true. Oh. And, and the moment Grave Clobber catches up, um yeah he's screwed so it, it's it's literally just a question of can countdown get you down to a quarter before you catch up because if so i feel like countdown can win yeah and you know i think that's definitely feasible and i think depending on exactly what attacks happen when pretty much you know if the totems manage to slow you down and depending on how many times i'm able to dodge the bombs before they explode um i think that that is definitely viable. I do think that Grave Clobber is going to get this the majority of the time. Probably. 
but I do think that countdown is very likely to at least get it 25% of the time. Also depends how much uh, Slam Bam and Countdown tag team. That's true. That's true, too. I was about to bring up, there are alternative outcomes. Like, for example, if Slam Bam were to come directly for Countdown, we, we would probably whittle each other down by a fair amount rather quickly because uh, Slam Bam does have the ability to catch Countdown fairly easily um, yeah. if, if I'm not careful enough. So That's true. Mm-hmm. That, that would open things up so Grave Clobber could just come in and wipe. Or if Slam Bam and Countdown were to uh, basically tag team the whole way through, it, it all depends on how how you cho- choose to uh, use Grave Clobber, whether you try and take Countdown out first or whether you try and take Slam Bam first. I feel like if you were to try to take Countdown first, uh, Grave Clobber would win it the majority of the time. If you tried to take Slam Bam first and the two were working together... I feel like it could come out to close to a 50-50 between Countdown and uh, Grave Clobber. Okay, I don't know if I'd exactly say 50-50. I do think no matter what the situation is, I think pretty much Grave Clobber is going to end up being the winner here. Yep. Probably. Nevertheless, depending on the strategies used in this arena setup, like Grave Clobber can definitely be whittled down on health decently well, oh, yes. depending on what direction I try to go with. Uh, for the character but overall it's just it's that massive health and that massive attack one and attack two damage that is going to make even though he's a melee character (laughs) really gonna make him a problem (laughs) yes for this archean arena i think i'm gonna have to give the victory to grave clobber that brings us to the end of today's episode i'd like to offer a special thank you to our guest to we me for joining us today You'll find our website and our individual channels, including Two Wee Me's, listed in the description. Follow our Twitter at SL Portalcasters for regular updates about the podcast, and join our Discord server for Skylanders discussions. Thank you for listening, and in the next episode, we will be joined by Naga Maikenu, who is playing Skylanders for the very first time and discussing their experience. See you then. Bye. Bye. Oh no. Oh no, now I'm worried that my lot has a shroom boom in it. <laughs> oh my. Oh no, it does. <laughs> oh <I> no. Was... <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's totally a rule that we didn't tell Tuli me. If your lot has a shroom boom, it's minus half a point. Wow. It's light core shroom boom and uh, series one shroom boom for anyone that wants to know how I'm going to be losing my points today. <laughs> <laughs>